So the uh, thermal state does have an important uh, impact on the engineering behavior of the material. You can see from these stress strain curves that the, uh, the properties change. Uh, its response to applied uh, stress uh, is highly variable depending on um, the temperature you're at in comparison to the glass transition temperature of the material. So if we uh, observe for a semi-crystalline glassy material, uh, we, we actually get um, a very strong uh, material, but it tolerates very little uh, deformation or very little strain. And so you see it load uh, and then fail. Uh, if we had an amorphous glassy material, that's curve B, you see that uh, its ultimate uh, strength is is not quite as good as with semi-crystalline however it tolerates a higher degree of deformation before failure and you see this is the variable region where some samples could experience uh, a much higher strain uh, but these samples are prone to break anywhere along that uh, that boundary there on the other hand, if you have a semi-crystalline uh, rubbery material, so in other words, there are some rigid crystalline uh, regions, but the amorphous regions that we were talking about earlier, uh, for instance, the regions that would be found here, are actually in their rubbery state. This is uh, the behavior of high-density polyethylene. Uh, you would have crystalline, physically cross-linked, uh, spherulites and then you have rubbery amorphous regions in between and this is kind of the secret to the great properties of HDPE so no it's not the absolute strongest uh, polymer out there however uh, it has very good toughness meaning it can deform somewhat without failure and so that's why uh, the semi-crystalline rubbery material, which you see our little logic here, is, is we are above TG, but we are below the melt temperature uh, for the crystalline domains. Uh, and so you have a, a yield point, and then you have this, um, this elongation period uh, in that stress strain curve, and so that really uh, embodies the idea of a tough polymer. And so it has implication on uh, on that morphology. So crystallization, why does it occur? So polymers crystallize when the crystalline state is more thermodynamically stable than the molten one. So if the interactions dictate that the most stable uh, conformation for these chains to be in would be a, a uniformly packed uh, crystal-like material, well then that's uh, the Gibbs free energy dictating which direction to go and we'll look uh, at the implication of that in a moment but the the system always proceeds towards a low energy state um, trying to minimize that Gibbs free energy or achieve the most negative value for Delta G uh, however uh, perfect crystallization is often hindered by things like chain entanglements uh, so if it weren't for all the entanglements, a, a hot, more highly perfected crystal might be able to be achieved, but because of entanglements, it goes until it can't, uh, sterically or entanglement-wise, can't get into the right position to continue the, the crystal, and so it, it, it stops. Uh, branches also prevent the perfect alignment needed to achieve the crystalline state. Uh, side group interactions often confound this behavior. Also, uh, just viscous drag on the chains as it's trying to attain uh, the crystalline uh, conformation uh, often hinders, uh, at least kinetically hinders, the growth of those crystals. So given enough time, the viscous drag is probably overcome, but if you have a cooling temperature, there's a certain range over which these crystals can form before chain mobility is so hindered it wouldn't be able to, to continue to, uh, to make crystal. Uh, make the crystals in that the crystallites in that polymer material and so that's the piece that really highlights uh, why there's a kinetic factor uh, during these crystallization events so if we consider the, the Gibbs equation in the context of, of crystallization uh, Delta H would be the heat that is is given off 
uh, quite literally as that polymer chain is or polymer uh, bulk material is cooling uh, when the crystals the crystallite uh, regions form it actually is exothermic it will bleed off some of that heat and if you imagine it has to it's giving up chain mobility uh, by making the, the crystalline domains and so that has that energy that internal energy has to go somewhere so it goes to heat uh, and so that makes a thermodynamic driving force but realize that delta s uh, which is a measure of the disorder, the disorder is actually uh, decreasing. We are retaining a more highly ordered state. Uh, so the entropy in this case is going down, which is bad from the perspective of the Gibbs free energy. Uh, because of this negative sign, you see that if, uh, if we decrease uh, the... Um, the entropy we actually cause the delta G to go to a more positive value and so that would be non-spontaneous but uh, what rescues that is since delta H is uh, is exothermic um, that results in uh, the ability to counteract uh, that uh, decrease in disorder or that movement to a more highly ordered state uh, but during a crystal crystallization event uh, these two are pointing in um, in different react different directions because of uh, that negative sign there in the Gibbs free energy uh, so that's really in the driver's seat uh, of, of this interaction in the background uh, but if we just sort of uh, talk our way through the, the logic here, so when delta G is negative, crystallization is energetically favorable. So as the temperature decreases, delta G becomes more negative, therefore more favorable. Uh, but the viscosity of the system during cooling also increases. It thickens up, meaning that it's harder for those chains to align. Uh, so semi-crystalline polymers exhibit this uh, equilibrium melting temperature at which uh, the crystalline and amorphous states are, are, are sort of in, in, in equilibrium. So uh, the chains uh, are, are sort of migrating uh, back and forth between the crystalline and amorphous um, states. So above this temperature, crystals melt. Below this temperature, crystals will nucleate and then grow as long as they're um, as long as they still have sufficient thermal agitation to uh, achieve um, the, the orientation that they'll need to, to join the crystal so if we look at the growth of the crystals uh, if we imagine our polymer chains aligned like this uh, the presence of that perfectly aligned or somewhat perfectly aligned uh, surface will cause other polymer chains to uh, respond to that environment and they can come in and layer on top uh, and therefore grow uh, in the direction of that, uh, that polymer chain. Now uh, above this would likely be a more messy uh, amorphous region and so we usually, usually don't see growth in that direction the uh, the vertical direction but along the faces that have the the, the the chains exposed side on well those are the growth faces and you you do see growth in uh, in those dimensions um, so in terminology here is in the a and b direction because c direction usually is alternating order disorder uh, order disorder through that material so during um, well, during commercial processing of polymers, uh, primarily crystallization is complete within a matter of a few seconds or at most a minute or two. If you think about that polymer material that is uh, injected and then held in a, in a mold, uh, you're typically trying to cool that as quickly as you can because you want to cycle through uh, as many parts as you possibly can. But there's a, there's a caution there. So if you cool that too quickly, you may not be attaining the full strength of the material because if you're not waiting long enough for the crystals uh, to form uh, then 
you're looking at this kind of kinetically hindered snapshot of, of the, the orientation that those polymers could achieve. They're trying to achieve the crystalline uh, physical cross links that, that could occur, but because it's cooled too quickly, it can't get there in time. And so the part that you might eject uh, in 20 seconds may not be as strong than if you had increased the mold temperature and held it at a, a higher temperature for longer uh, which could allow the the full maximum crystal size uh, to form and so the thermal um, cycle time does impact uh, semi-crystalline materials and you've got to be careful to make sure that you are optimizing your uh, cycle time and strength accordingly it really can have an effect um, so we've already pretty much discussed this uh, figure earlier. This is the the the, the peacock figure 7.9 that's uh, looking at uh, the difference between the, the tight folding of a single chain or multiple chains that are um, aligning themselves. We've already vetted that idea pretty well. Uh, so a few terms: uh, nucleation, that initial grouping of aligned chains that starts the process. Primary crystallization, so when segments deposit themselves on the face of a growing crystallite, that's that primary crystallization event that we were talking about. Uh, secondary crystallization is rearrangement of the semicrystalline solid over time, converting amorphous chains into crystalline chains. Uh, that results in kind of a bulking up of, um, or I guess crystallite thickening. And so that would be if you were to help hold the temperature uh, at that crystallization temperature, sort of annealing is the term that's used, annealing the material, allowing those crystals to grow and attain their maximum size, um, their highest percent crystallinity uh, possible. And so the crystallization rate depends on uh, molecular characteristics and external conditions, so how tangled, how long the polymer chains are, how, if they're branched or not, uh, how quickly the material is cooled, all these things uh, affect that rate of crystallization. So how are these things characterized? So we'll look at this fairly quickly, but scattering measurements, microscopy, DSC, and density are, are common ways of evaluating this. Uh, so we're not going to go into to full detail here, but uh, you may be familiar with the fact that crystal planes uh, can be characterized by x-ray scattering or neutron scattering. Uh, these two methods are governed by Bragg's Law, and so in the spacing uh, or rather n is the is an integer uh, which refers to the order of diffraction typically n is equal to to one uh, if you're looking at a, a, a primary scattering pat pattern uh, lambda is the wavelength of that incident radiation uh, so usually x-rays are on the order of 0.1 to 0.2 nanometers and so really quite small uh, then 2D, D is that spacing that you're backing out of the calculation that's a characteristic spacing in that crystalline material. And then sine of theta, where theta is the scattering uh, angle. And so how is this uh, accomplished? Well, there's some radiation source. Uh, let's say it's an x-ray source. The x-rays get collimated. They then go through the sample. And then because of the, uh, the spacing that uh, might be characteristic in that material it will hit that spacing and through constructive and destructive interference of the scattered material you will get uh, you will get this it's called a reflection in some cases but it's really not a reflection it's really just an, an intense spot that is a, a result of that mathematical uh, relationship between the wavelength and the spacing and so you will get uh, scattering of that light at some angle with respect to that incident beam and using the pattern of um, intense spots you can then back out back calculate the original spacing that had to be in the sample to produce uh, that pattern now polymer samples typically give broader um, 